Hey everyone, before we get into the video today, I want to tell you how I've been invited to join the incredible and awesome team of narrators over at Chilling. If you love horror and love listening to horror stories, then you're going to love what they have going on over at the Chilling app. Chilling is a new, groundbreaking platform that propels your listening experience beyond what YouTube can offer. Let me pull back the curtain on some of the features Chilling has to offer you. We've compiled over thousands of spine-tingling and nightmare-inducing stories, real accounts that will send shivers down your spine, and a broad range of eerie fiction categories. We've got something for anyone and everyone. It also grants you the power to handpick your favorite tales and create your own individualized playlist, something not even offered here on YouTube. One of my favorite facets of Chilling is the ambient sound menu. Seamlessly transition the background noise of your story without interrupting anything. Choose from a roaring, crackling campfire, to rain, or even just some spooky ambient music to accompany each and every story you listen to. You're in control. Chilling is constantly adding new and more stories weekly. They've already broadened their fear factor to include classic novels, vintage horror radio, and more audio series. Chilling is also ecstatic to announce the development of Chilling 2.0, enriching the platform with Chilling original movies and shows. Chilling is also now offering an ad-free experience with a modest subscription. This not only enables you to download content, but gives you the perk of early access to originals and exclusives. If you prefer listening for free, you can still enjoy Chilling, complemented by any ads. So it's holding you back. Find us in your app store by searching Chilling, or just simply click the link below that's in the description of this video, and you'll be taken directly over to Chilling where you can find me and so many other talented narrators. I'll meet you there, friends, with booze and booze. It was September in central Idaho. Autumn had come down to the mountains, and with it, bow hunters looking for mountain goats. My cousin, let's call him Vern for anonymity's sake, is an avid hunter. He's been all over North America hunting various game. Bears in Alaska, wild hogs in Texas, bighorn sheep in Wyoming. But his favorite hunting area was the Lemhi Mountain Range in central Idaho. Our extended family has been hunting in those mountains for generations. We know every river bottom and mountain peak, like many people know their own neighborhoods. Mountain goats are a fascinating animal to hunt. They live well above the tree line in rocky environments. They are sure-footed and can climb near vertical slopes. Hunting these animals requires one to venture into these dangerous areas. You have to be mindful when you pursue an animal like that. One wrong step on a rocky slope or one loose rock could mean you're not going home ever again. Vern was an expert mountain hunter. It's something he was born to do. Vern decided to hunt in the Hayden River area of the Lemhis. It's a very familiar spot to most locals and the area is home to plenty of mountain goats. The first mile of Vern's hike was uneventful as he climbed up the canyon. The air was crisp and his breath formed like great plumes as he progressed. The sun was just peeking over the mountains when Vern came to a small deer trail. He decided it might be a nice shortcut from his usual route and took it. A few hundred feet up the trail, he saw something odd pop out from behind a tree it was a man. He was dressed in a light denim coat and jeans and was carrying a small backpack. My cousin stopped for a second to get his bearings, unsure of where this guy came from. The man waved to him with both arms. One of them was holding an older style hunting bow. Acknowledging him, Vern waved back. Although the man looked to be physically fine, it was clear that he was emotionally distressed. He yelled out something my cousin couldn't quite hear and waved his arm, indicating my cousin should follow him. Vern didn't get any bad vibes from this man and could tell that he was genuinely in need of some kind of help. He began to make his way up the canyon, following the mystery man. Vern could never gain any ground on this guy. He was always just far enough away that he couldn't talk to him. Periodically, the man would stop, turn toward him, and make sure Vern was still following. Every time he looked back, Vern could see the worry in his face. 
My cousin did his best to remain calm and keep a smile on his face, unsure who or what he was being led to. It was peculiar, Vern thought as he hiked. He hadn't seen any other vehicles on his drive up to the trailhead. Perhaps he came in over another ridge? What could he possibly be leading him to? He figured one of his hunting party had been hurt and needed help. Of course, he wouldn't have to speculate if the man would just stop and talk to him for five minutes. Vern lost sight of the guy just past a turn in the trail. The trail opened up into an incredibly steep, rocky towel slope. He looked in every direction and could not locate the man when he heard a whistle. Looking up, he saw the guy about 500 feet up the rocky slope, waving at him. There's no possible way he could have gotten up that far just in that short amount of time that Vern had lost sight of him. He still didn't feel any fear or weariness about this weird situation. The man was now waving more frantically, practically begging Vern to follow him up the slope. With a sigh and a grunt, he started up the rocks. It was slow going. Every other step caused a mini rock slide and would cause him to continuously lose his footing. Huffing and puffing on the cool, thin air, my cousin eventually made it up to a small landing. It had taken him almost 45 minutes to get to that spot where he saw the man from below. There was no earthly way anyone could have done that scramble up that hill any faster. Totally exhausted and out of breath, Vern sat down on the stone landing. He looked around and couldn't see the man anywhere. As he scanned his surroundings, he saw something odd poking out of a boulder about 20 feet away from him. Walking over to it, he found a weathered boot. Two boots, actually. Inside those boots, and under the boulder as well, were bones. Vern looked around once again for the man, but he never saw him again. Instead of feeling eerie or unnerving, Vern felt a sense of relief wash over him. These emotions weren't his own. What he felt seemed to come from all around him. He marked the spot with his GPS and decided to make his way down and call the authorities. The Lemhi County Sheriff's Office responded and he led them all the way up to the canyon to the body. It took four grown men to push the boulder out of the way and when they did, they found the skeletal remains of a man. On the body, they found hunting equipment and some personal effects. From a credit card in the wallet, they were able to identify the man. He was a bow hunter that had gone missing almost exactly 53 years beforehand. Vern never wanted to be identified to the public or the missing hunter's family. He didn't want recognition for something like that. To him, it was just one of those bizarre mountain stories. He was happy that the family got closure even if it was half a century later. The only thing that bothered him was the man leading him up the canyon and with his strange and sudden disappearance. He had mentioned the waving man to the sheriff but brushed it off. When the news reports came out announcing the discovery, several photos of the man were published. Byrne was absolutely shocked when he saw them. In those photos was the man that he'd seen leading him up the mountain to that body. It all finally made sense to him. The man's distressed look, the constant checking if Vern was following him, the sense of relief he felt when the body was discovered. That man was desperate to get home, and through Vern, he was able to be reunited with his family. During my time in college, I had a friend whose dad owned an 800-acre piece of land in eastern Texas. In the past, he had leased it out to hunters and paper companies, but was no longer doing it. He had built a cabin on the land a few years before and would let us go out there from time to time and mess around. It served as a great way to relax from the pressures of school and get closer to nature. The spring break of 1997, we loaded up our trucks and headed for the cabin. Our plans were to go shooting, drink beer, and other things rednecks like us do in the woods. Our first morning kept us busy cleaning the cabin and moving all of our stuff inside. Around dinner time, 
We made a big fire outside and cooked a bunch of steaks and fried potatoes. We skipped dessert and broke open some beers. The sun went down not long after, and for the remainder of the evening, we got loaded and passed around a joint or two. At some point in the night, I heard a shuffling noise outside and went out to check on it. The fire was barely burning at that point, and just outside of its light, I swore I could see the shape of a man standing completely still. From what I could tell, he was facing me, perhaps waiting to see what I would do. I blinked my eyes real hard to get a clearer look, but my position and the lack of light made it too hard to see him clearly. The shape continued to stand still, so I decided I would walk up a little closer in hopes of getting a better picture. The thought terrified me, but I was transfixed by the being. Or perhaps I was still too intoxicated to make wise decisions. I took two steps forward, but was distracted by a voice behind me. My friend had woken up and noticed the door was wide open. So, he got out of bed and saw me walking around the fire. His voice caused me to jump a little, but I soon realized who it was speaking. I asked him if he saw the figure on the other side of the fire pit. He just laughed at me and said I must be so stoned I was seeing things. We laughed it off and returned to bed. On my way, I turned back to take one more look, but the shape was no longer there. I chuckled to myself and went back to sleep. The next morning, I wrote the whole experience off as the result of too much fun and went on with my day. We spent the first half of it fishing at the big pond. Post-lunch was shooting, and one guy brought a compound bow. The beers and smoke were broken out after dinner. A game of poker was attempted, but soon canceled in favor of another evening telling lies around the fire. On one of my many trips to relieve myself that night, I was spooked by the sound of a stick breaking close by and hurriedly made my way back to the fire. The look of fear on my face made the other guys laugh their butts off. I tried to explain what had happened, but was quickly reminded that we were not the only creatures in these woods. The reasoning seemed sound, so I accepted it. Not long after, we were standing around, involved in some deep discussion, and I turned to speak to the guy on my left, What I saw caused me to clench up so tight, I could have snapped a steel rod with my sphincter, standing within a few steps behind my friend, was another man I did not recognize. It was like he appeared out of nowhere. What made it creepier was that he was staring intently at the back of his head, almost like he was trying to bore through it with his eyes. I remained frozen stiff. The longer I looked at him, I realized he was the same being I saw lingering outside the light of the fire the night before. He was average height with a long, unkempt beard. My friend continued rambling about whatever, unaware of his shadow. After several long seconds, the stranger turned to me with a blank expression and walked away. This was when my friend finally noticed my horrified look. When he spoke, the thrall of fear was released, and I began pointing and rambling about what I had just witnessed. He and my other friend laughed at me again. There was no way I was seeing things this time. I described the man, and one of them suggested that he was Bigfoot. Despite my protestations, no one was buying it, and I eventually cut my losses and shut up. However, I was not beat. Their mockery had made me even more determined to prove the stranger's existence. The next two days were quiet. No stranger, in other words, but I kept my eyes peeled for anything out of the ordinary. By our fifth morning, I was beginning to question my sanity. I had seen this mysterious man stalking around us twice, and now, 
he had suddenly disappeared. I resolved to put my quest on the back burner until some new evidence arose. My friend's dad had mentioned to him, an owner of one of the surrounding properties had spotted a small group of wild hogs running through his land, and so we grabbed our rifles and went on the search for them. After a mile or so, down one of the property's main roads, we came across some hog wallows and knew that we were on the scent. We went up the road, now on foot, tracking them. Another mile on, we stumbled upon three large hogs rooting up the ground and prepared to make bacon. Two of us chambered around as quiet as possible on our rifles and took aim. I was less than a second from saying three and pulling the trigger when the loud crack of another rifle filled the air followed closely by a burst of wood and bark above my friend's head. It took a moment for it to register that someone was shooting at us. A few seconds later, another crack and strike, this time even closer to my friend. We weren't going to wait for a third. The friend who appeared to be the target led us down the side trail that led back to the cabin. No more shots followed as we fled. However, instead of finding safety at the camp, the shots began again. Seeing no other option, we hopped into my truck and hauled out of there. This was a time just before the commonality of cell phones, so we had to drive the 20 miles to town to get help. After we explained the situation, we returned to the property a few hours later with some deputies. We approached slowly and remained in the cars when we parked. We waited to see if the shots would start again, but nothing happened. A cursory look around counted three holes in the cabin and another two in my buddy's windshield. Perhaps the worst part was that all of our camping stuff, sleeping bags and such, were spread out all over the ground. Luckily, we had smoked everything the night before. Nothing was missing but a box of 3030 ammo and, strangely, my sleeping bag and wool blanket. A theory began to form in the deputies' minds that we had stumbled upon a squatter or poacher camping out on the property for whatever reason. They acted as if they were going to let it go, but once my friend's dad who owned the land heard about it, he put pressure on them to start a search. This was about the time I repeated my story of seeing someone lurking around the cabin. No one was laughing now and my story was finally being taken seriously by somebody. The search was led around the property by my friend's dad. School had already begun again by the time it took place. It continued for a full week, but nothing other than a few old camps were found. It was assumed that he knew the heat would be on him after the shooting incident and moved on. During the course of the investigation, several avenues were followed to ID the stranger like escaped cons, but he remains unidentified to this day. Because of the chance of another attack, our trips to the property ended. The next year we tried to camp out somewhere else, but it wasn't the same, and our nature getaways died out. Within five years my friend's dad had a heart attack and lost interest in the cabin. The paper company's lease was renewed and the land's trees have been used to make paper and pulp wood products ever since. Each time I jot down a quick note, I'm reminded of our awesome trips and especially the odd and terrifying week that caused them to stop. I do once or twice a year talk to my old college friend on the phone. As far as he has heard, that crazy stranger still has not been caught. We sometimes theorize as to his origins and where he may have ended up. I, however, often take this much further when I'm alone. I wonder why our so-called stranger seemed to focus so much of his anger onto my friend, and perhaps far more concerning, is he still out there waiting for his chance to finish what he began all those years ago?
This is a true story and I've been kind of obsessing over, like, what happened out there. I'll try to keep it as brief as possible without leaving any key details out. My wife's Uncle Jay bought some land just north of Spokane, Washington with a friend of the family, Kay. They got it at a significant discount because of a nearby aluminum smelter had polluted the ground and was impossible to use the water beneath the ground. They had set up two plots and each had a camper to live in. Jay had been getting progressively and progressively more paranoid, saying people were stalking him and watching him in the trees. About three months into living there, a man wandered through the woods and had an interaction with Jay, ended up attacking him and breaking his jaw. Upon being arrested, the man said that he was overcome with desire to see if he could kill him. Two months later, Jay was murdered in his sleep on the couch in his camper. Kay found him and immediately ran away as far as he could and then stopped to call the police. There was sufficient evidence of who did it and they quickly caught the killer who was a 19 year old boy who said he just simply wanted his bike. He beat him to death with a power tool that was laying on the floor nearby, completely bashed his brains in. Kay was now completely terrified at all times to be out there alone. He'd moved in with a family member until eight months later he ended up with nowhere else to go and had to return. In constant fear, he finally convinced my pregnant wife and I to come stay with him. The second I turned off the highway onto the property, I was overcome with dread. There was at least 250 crows covering the dirt road up to the property. I didn't sleep whatsoever that first night. I stared into the forest, searching for the cause of this intense fear. The energy of this place was so uncomfortable, and I just assumed it was simply because Uncle Jay was killed here. Even the days were eerie. Never did I have a moment where I didn't feel watched. My wife and I always had that sense of fear, especially after dark. Things sort of normalized for a while, until one day Kay began puking and feeling very lightheaded all the time. I took him to the hospital and they said he was probably fine, possibly just a flu. At this point, it was the anniversary of Jay's murder. Three days after the date of Jay's death, Kay comes running out of his camper screaming that he couldn't breathe. Waking my wife and I up, we run out to see what was wrong. Kay had gotten into his car and floored it crashing into a tree nearby. I ran up to peer through the window to see the most intense and most primal fear that I've ever seen in someone's eyes. He was gasping and clutching his chest. Moments later, he let out a breath one last time and then he was dead. I attempted to give him CPR for 30 minutes until EMS arrived. On July 10th, one year and three days after moving there, Jay and Kay were both dead. Now it was only me and the wife alone on the property, every morning living in fear and not understanding what had happened out here. Still don't know why we didn't leave right away. One day I came out to get fresh water from the drum we kept for water, to smell the worst smell that I've ever smelled. The water container had one inch opening on the top and inside the water was bits and pieces of chipmunks, like spines and heads. They didn't just fall in, something had to have ripped them apart before putting them inside. The nights got worse and worse. I never saw anything, just always filled with unease and intense fear. I grew up in the deep mountains of North Idaho, with the nearest town being 30 miles away. Fear in the woods even at night is new for me. Hearing crashing and footsteps every single night. One night, my wife and I returned home to have the worst feeling that I've ever felt yet. Everything looked different. Although everything was right where we left it, nothing seemed in place. Looking around, I suddenly see this orange long-haired manged cat just sitting on a stump. The eyes were very intense, fiery, almost glowing, but not quite. We then started hearing branches snapping, pine needles crunching, seemingly from every direction. I'm just staring at this cat, almost frozen in fear. Suddenly, 
A voice breaks out, echoing through the forest. Hello? Anyone out there? It sounded almost like a little girl, but something was off. My wife yelled back. Hello? Are you okay? Anybody? The voice had changed. Help me! Help me! We yelled back several times without a response. Somebody can help me! The most intense shrieking, evil sounding voice. I'm now filled with more intense fear than I can ever describe, but my wife, she is overcome with the need to find this person, and she starts heading off into the forest without a word. I grabbed her arm, telling her something isn't right. Why won't this person respond to us? She continues to break free and run off alone into the woods. I tell her to get back into the truck. I'll grab the spotlights, but we aren't going on foot. Thankfully, I convince her. And we roll down the windows and shine my intense bright LED lights throughout the forest. We slowly creep down the road yelling back, still not getting any kind of response. As we get down further on the road, a voice speaks out yet again. Please, won't anyone help me? The sounds are difficult to pin down in the woods, but this one was now very close. I hit the brakes and stop immediately. We shine the lights and yell back, continuing our search. No sign of anyone. When suddenly the voice explodes into the cabin of the vehicle, as if they were standing right outside my window. Help me. Somebody can help me. Leaving my ears hurting and ringing. I hit the gas and didn't look back. I called the police when we hit the highway. And afterwards, when they reached back out, after checking it out for themselves, they said no one was out there. No one was around. I went back the next day to get our stuff. And my wife ended up giving birth the following day. We never stayed out there again after the baby was born. What the hell could do those kind of things? I never even believed in the paranormal before, but now, I don't know how else to explain it all. There is a reason why I have to be talked into camping every time it comes up in conversation with either friends or family. I don't mind the outdoors and I don't mind nature. I just feel like I want to sleep in bed and not on the ground in a tent. On this specific year, my boyfriend talked me into going camping, but this time we would be staying in a cabin so I can sleep in a bed. I still voted for the ocean, but at least I was actually going to be sleeping in a bed. The trip consisted of me and my boyfriend and two other couples. The six of us found a nice cabin in the woods that was mostly secluded and was only about a hundred yard walk to this beautiful lake that we could swim in. I didn't want to admit it, but I was actually feeling this trip quite a bit, especially once we got there. The first day was amazing. We spent all day walking some trails, swimming in the lake, and in the early evening we decided to cook up some steaks on the grill, and it was a great first day. That night we all went inside and went to bed at around midnight if I had to guess. I didn't sleep very well. I thought that I could hear something outside all night, but I just chalked it up to my imagination. After all, we were in the woods, so hearing strange noises all night long is not that weird. The next morning, we were all outside getting ready for a nice hike when we heard this jolly voice shout from behind us. Why, hello there. How are y'all doing today? My boyfriend, being the always social butterfly that he is, started talking to the guy right away. He told us his name was Wayne, and that he was an expert in all the trails around here. And the whole interaction was just slightly strange, but I suppose not alarming. He said he lived nearby, and that he was hiking some trails, and he heard us talking, and he just wanted to make sure that we were settling in okay. I remember thinking it was sweet of him to check in with us. He was a bigger guy, I would say well over six feet tall, and he had a pretty big gut. He had a backpack on with hiking boots and jeans, so he really didn't look like anything other than a typical hiking local. We thanked him, and he laughed in this jolly voice, and he went on his way. As we hiked, we laughed about Wayne for a little while. 
When the afternoon came, we all decided to go to the lake to swim for a few hours before heading back to the cabin. When we got down to the lake, we were sitting on the dock soaking up the sun, and from beyond the trees, we heard that voice again. There they are! We all jumped back because honestly it scared us, because now standing at the edge of the dock was Wayne again. We asked what he was doing and again he claimed that he was just wandering by and happened to see all of us out there. My boyfriend laughed it off and talked with him for a little while, but my friend Tina's boyfriend and I felt uneasy about this. The entire time they were talking, Wayne just nodded, laughed, and kept looking around. After they finished their conversation, he kept mumbling, okay, under his breath, and then walked away. It was weird, but not really scary, at least not yet. That night, as we were all sitting around the campfire sharing scary stories, I felt even more uncomfortable for some reason. Suddenly, Wayne jumped out of the bushes without warning and yelled in this sort of joking voice, Here I am! Followed by a loud and excited laugh. We all jumped out of our skin, even worse than at the docks. At this point, my boyfriend was upset and kind of yelled at Wayne, telling him to just leave us alone and go back home. He explained that scaring us like that wasn't cool and Wayne was lucky none of us retaliated out of instinct. Wayne looked upset and claimed that he was just trying to help us have some memorable experiences on our trip. He left on one of the trails, I guess, and he seemed to look pretty visibly upset. I almost felt sorry for him until I realized that it was after 11 and there was no good reason for him to be wandering around our camp. The experience put a damper on the rest of the night and we ended up calling it a night not long after that. We went inside and cleaned up the place since we were supposed to be leaving early in the morning. Once in bed, I told my boyfriend that I wasn't feeling great about this whole Wayne situation. I had a bad feeling that he would somehow come out again. I couldn't stop thinking that that weird noise that I heard the night before might actually be from this goofball. That night, I was wide awake again. I'm not sure of the time, but at some point during the night, I could distinctly hear breathing and footsteps outside the window. I woke up my boyfriend and begged him to check for me. He was annoyed at first, but then changed his tone instantly. I saw him look out, and his skin turned white as a ghost, and he whispered to me that he could see someone outside the cabin, pacing back and forth, and he thinks it's Wayne. I went to the window and tried not to draw any attention to us. What appeared to be Wayne seemed to be arguing with himself, talking but almost incoherently. He attempted to open the locked door and when he couldn't, he started pounding his head as if upset with himself. And after pacing for a few more minutes, he seemed to just disappear back into the woods. We were horrified and didn't know what to do. My boyfriend called the owner of the cabin and informed him that we were also calling the police. A cop car showed up a few minutes later and we explained the entire day's events to the officer, including Wayne's appearance. The cop didn't seem too bothered and just simply nodded along. It felt like he was just sort of listening for the sake of listening and didn't grasp the potential severity of the situation. We packed up our stuff, made some coffee and just stayed awake until dawn and once the sun was rising, we loaded up the van and headed home. Once we got to the main road, we saw Wayne walking by himself. He still seemed to be just sort of mumbling to himself, hitting his head from time to time. We called the dispatcher and told them that we had just seen Wayne, who had been trying to break into our house earlier, walking on the road, and that was the end of it on our side. I'm not sure if the cops ever eventually picked him up, or if he just fled back into the woods. I wonder if he really does live nearby or if he was just some strange man wandering around hoping to cause harm. I'm happy nothing physically happened to us but from now on they all can go camping without me. I'm posting this for 80% entertainment value and 20% feedback. This is entirely non-fictional. 
I'm not a spiritual person. I'm resistant to energies and vibes. Though I believe there are others who are more tapped into the surroundings than I am in that regard. I'm a cynic. And with most paranormal things, especially. I live in the foothills of western North Carolina. Near the base of the Blue Ridge. I've lived in the mountains for a few years and hated it up there. I despise the woods with a burning passion. Yet, just my luck, I've moved back in with my folks, in their cabin surrounded by the woods. The land my family owns stretches across 15 acres of woodland. Now these are the woods that I grew up in. Despite my typical aversion to nature, I feel pretty safe in them. I climbed the trees and splashed in the creek, and played with stick swords when I was a kid. These woods are home. Except for the area behind my backyard. Our cabin is positioned at the top of a pretty steep hill that slopes down for about a half a mile before it bottoms out at a creek down in the woods. The halfway point between the house and the creek is this little patch of woods, right behind the fenced in area around the house. It's always in shade, no thick undergrowth, just trees, Carolina red clay, piles of leaves, the usual. But it feels really weird down there in a way I cannot explain. I feel very unwelcome out behind the house, and I'm not the only one. My parents avoid it too. Even our pets, past and present, have always steered clear of it. I'm going to list some of my experiences that might get my point better across. When I was eight or nine, one summer I thought I'd try camping in the backyard. I set up my family's unused tent, loaded it up with an air mattress and a pile of blankets, copper my beloved dear Stuffy, and some comic books. I guess I just wanted to be excited about it. But even before the sun went down, when my mom was helping me set my little camping trip up, I felt uneasy. The shady path of woods around the backyard was just weird. But I was a kid, so I figured whatever. I'm 20 feet from the house, I'll be fine. To those who are reading this, I was not fine. I got set up for the night, stayed up reading comics, felt like an outdoorsman, and it had barely gotten dark when I began hearing loud, rhythmic crunching in the woods behind the backyard, like something big was walking in circles around the undergrowth. We don't have bears in my neck of the woods. Besides, whatever it was, it was definitely walking on two legs. It never tried to approach the backyard, even as I sat there with Copper just listening to it. It just kept walking. I barely lasted an hour in that damn tent before running inside and getting into my own bed. My mother is an avid gardener, and she decided one day she was going to put together four or five raised gardening beds in the backyard for herbs and veggies. This was when I was 11-ish, so naturally I was roped in to help. We spent the first part of the spring putting them together and getting them started. I began noticing that both of us would get really edgy and irritable back there. We're best friends and we never fight, but we'd be snapping at one another constantly, raising up that damn garden. I also noticed for the first time that the woods behind the house are deathly quiet. Playing music or talking didn't make a difference. It was that kind of silence that presses in on you, and it's always like that back there. The beds actually thrived for a little while but mom would always ask me to come with her when she tended to them. I thought it was silly at the time. When I got older, she told me she just couldn't be down there by herself. She'd wait until I was home from school before checking on them because she felt too uneasy and unwelcome down there. Eventually, we abandoned the project. The raised beds are still back there, by the way, rotting away in the undergrowth. I haven't checked on them since middle school, I'm 23 now. Lastly, and in my opinion, the creepiest, was the time that I asked my mom to cut my hair. We were poor back then, so rather than go to a salon, mom just gave me twice monthly trims. It was late spring and warm, so she suggested that we cut it in the backyard for easier cleanup. I was maybe 13 or 14 at this point. We ventured down, I brought a stool, and sat diligently while she cut my hair. 
side note, my mom has always cut my hair. She's very good at it. She doesn't make mistakes. This is important. As she worked and we talked, I noticed that old familiar uneasy feeling. We were not welcome back there. The tree stood still and shadowy, despite the brilliantly sunny day. I remembered that it was cold, very cold. My mom finished up my haircut and I shook off the extra debris to let her admire her handiwork. She stepped around in front of me, angled my head this way and that way, and said it looked good. Three things happened in very quick succession. First, I felt this squeeze of pressure on my lungs like I couldn't breathe. It was such a weird sensation that I just froze. All of the uneasiness of the atmosphere pressed in on me all at once. Second, my mom got this weird vacant look on her face. I remember her smile fading and her eyes going a little glassy, like she was lost in thought. And then, she reached out with the scissors, still making this empty expression, and snipped a deep cut into the skin right over my left eye. I freaked out, jumped off the stool and backed away. At the same time, she seemed to gather herself again and was almost in tears. She apologized over and over, not even bothering to take anything with us as we ran back up to the house to treat the cut and stop the bleeding. I still have a little scar there today, and she's never forgiven herself for it. There wasn't even any hair hanging over that eye either. I had a pixie cut at the time. So yeah, a few of the many weird experiences that make me avoid the backyard now. I haven't even been down there in seven or eight years. But now that I'm living here again, I sometimes look into the backyard and feel that weird shudder of apprehension. What's the deal? Why don't we feel welcome in a 50 square foot patch of land that we own? Why is it so dark and quiet all the time? I have no idea. But my parents and I just work around it and pretend it isn't there. Posting in here in hopes that someone outside my friend circle can make me make sense of one of the weirdest and creepiest encounters I've ever had involving a stranger. Bear with me, there's some setup to get out of the way, and the story won't make any sense. I live in Utah, and spend nearly every weekend I can out exploring the state's west desert for the last decade or so. It's mostly an absolutely empty no man's land, full of abandoned mines, grazing sheep, and military test ranges. One area in particular is a small mountain range outside of Wendover on the west end of the state. I'm obsessed with it, and probably know this range more intimately than any other person alive. I've hiked every prominent peak, driven every side canyon, hiked to every major abandoned mine. This just sets the stage for how familiar and experienced I am with this area. The range sits next to the famous Bonneville Salt Flats. If you're not familiar with it, this is a dry alkaline lake bed, covering nearly 50 square miles. It's one of the few wide open spots on Earth, large enough to hold annual races where the world's land speed records have been set at nearly 800 miles per hour. When we're not holding an annual race week, you're free to drive out onto the flats, wherever you want. It's a surreal experience to camp out there when the wind isn't bad, so I do it frequently, almost always alone. My friends do not share my enthusiasm for exploration. There is a particular spot on the flats that I like to go camp at. It's as remote and flat as remote gets, literally 10 miles from the nearest road, hill, sagebrush, or even rock. You have to imagine intuitively that if you see someone else anywhere out there, you tend to stay away. You have no idea what motivates other people for having being out there. They could be transporting drugs, hiding a body or whatever. It's just best to remain cautious. With that being said, I've never been bothered in a decade of doing this, never heard bad news, and no one else has ever come within miles of me. On the most silent air nights, you can literally hear a passing car approaching from several miles away, and the metal reflects like the sun. On August 31st, 2019, I went out to my same familiar camping spot, 
It was exactly 104 degrees Fahrenheit that day. So I had a large orange sun shelter staked up to next to my truck. It was pin drop silent all day, to the point where your ears sort of rung a bit. The heat baked the salty surface so much that it was all curled up everywhere into this crunchy sushi roll texture. They were unavoidable walking around and made a large, satisfying crunch sound. I didn't see a single car on the horizon in any direction all day. I could only just barely hear the rumble of a train, nearly 10 miles away. Around 7 p.m., I fell asleep for a nap under my sun shelter. I woke up naturally about an hour later. I stood up to stretch and spun slowly around, fully surveying my 360 degree flat view for miles for any sign of life. Nothing. It was about 45 minutes until the sun set behind the mountains, but plenty bright to see clearly. Still about 100 degrees and dead silent. I was wearing a bright blue shirt, and I carry a small handgun in my chest holster when I'm out there just for safety. I want it to be accessible with the backpack on, and also visible should I ever come across creeps on my hike. I started to chop up wood I'd brought for a campfire for maybe only two or three minutes. I was about 30 feet away from my truck and sun shelter. Suddenly between chops, I hear something behind me that sounds like the fabric of my shelter rustling. It took my brain an odd half second to process it because I hadn't heard really anything besides myself all day. The air was dead still. I quickly spun around and there was a girl. I absolutely froze and my blood drained into my feet. She was only maybe 50 yards away, walking sort of toward my camp, but slightly diagonally across the front of my truck, headed in the direction of the further wilderness. What I'd heard was actually her footsteps, loudly crunching the salty texture of the ground that I mentioned earlier. She wasn't looking directly at me, she was just walking at a normal pace. She appeared to be roughly 18 years old, wearing a homemade tie-dye shirt and jean shorts. She was wearing Converse sneakers, not running or hiking shoes. She had no water or a backpack, no hat or even sunglasses, walking directly towards the setting sun in 100 degree heat. She didn't look disheveled in any way or even remotely tired, so I had a tough time processing what was happening for the first several seconds. I quickly scanned the horizon behind her for another person, a car, anything. There was nothing, just her. I stood up and put the axe down and sort of blurted something out dumb like, a uh, hot day for a walk, ain't it? Everything all right? I was shaking, absolutely flabbergasted at what she was doing and how and why she had made it practically next to me without me hearing or seeing her approach without really even turning her head to look at me while still walking, now almost next to my truck, she returns with, my friends are right there. She motioned behind her back with her thumb in a strange apathetic way. There was nothing behind her as far as I could see for many miles. She continued on past my camp toward the mountain range miles away to the Northwest. I was so surprised to have human contact in such a remote spot and so suddenly that I really had nothing to say. By the time I thought to offer her some water or ask again if she was okay, she was almost 150 yards away now, but I could still hear her crunchy footsteps as if she was right next to me. I grabbed my binoculars and just stared intently at her as she continued on. I fully expected her to vaporize into some kind of mirage or for me to wake up in my chair again. My jaw was on the ground in shock. I sat against my truck for a full 15 minutes, never taking my eyes off her in the binoculars. She never once looked back at me or changed her pace. She has to have nearly been a mile away at this point, and I could still hear her crunching footsteps plain as day. As the sun was now setting, she started to slightly bend into the darker mountain range on the horizon. Then. I hear her phone ring. I didn't have cell service myself. Through the binoculars, I see her reach into her pocket and even the faint murmur of her talking. I cannot express how quiet it was. She was only on the phone for maybe a minute and just kept walking. 
About a minute after that, I suddenly begin to hear a car behind me. I spin back around and there are headlights on the opposite horizon, maybe three miles away coming toward me. The engine noise was loud. I could tell that they were traveling fast. I was now starting to get super paranoid, like this was some sort of setup or recon on my camp, and a wide variety of other slightly irrational things. I didn't know if I was being robbed or messed with in some other way, so I took cover behind my truck and just waited. It looked like they were driving right at me, and very fast. Not a minute later, this car goes sailing past my camp, rudely kicking up a huge dust cloud, headed in the vague direction of that girl. It was a late 90s Range Rover. Despite all their windows being open, and them only being 50 yards away, they were doing at least 50 miles per hour. And it was getting dark, so I couldn't identify any passengers. I could now no longer see that girl. A short while later, I see their taillights approach roughly where I lost track of the girl. I see brake lights, then headlights, then brake lights, and repeat, like they were spinning donuts on the salt. Then I see headlights again. I hear the engine rev back up loudly. They're racing back toward me now, again. I take cover behind my truck. At this point, I chamber around because I was convinced I was about to be messed with. A minute later, same thing. They go flying past my camp in the direction that they'd come from, fortunately without stopping, but now even faster and closer than the first pass. It was certainly some type of signal or message directly to me. I could have had a kid or a dog running around or something. It was very dangerous of them. After a couple of minutes, their taillights disappear over the horizon and into the direction of town. I didn't know what to do or what to think. Nothing I'd witnessed was technically illegal, but it made no sense at all. What was that girl doing out there? 10 miles on foot from anything. My immediate thought, well, she was some kind of endurance athlete training for an Ironman race or something. But she was too young and, again, wasn't dressed right. Had no supplies. Maybe she got into a fight with her parents or friends while driving around the flats and then stomped away from them for a couple of hours. I don't know. Why did she approach my camp alone? With me, another stranger, obviously swinging an axe and wearing a gun. How did I not hear or see her approach? Was she being trafficked or something, or maybe worse? Why wouldn't she have asked me for help or shown some kind of concern on her face? Perhaps she was going to, but decided not to as she got closer to me, though I really don't think she never would have gotten as close as she did if she was in that case. Since I had no cell service, I couldn't report it. Even so, the likelihood that I would be able to point out their location or anything useful to one or two sheriffs that patrol Wendover 15 miles away was very low. I immediately decided to move my camp though. I thought, maybe they're going to come back, maybe they've now marked my location. I set up camp again about 10 miles away, higher in the foothills in the mountains. I was hoping for cell service there, but still nothing. In a disappointing end to the story, I went to bed and called the sheriff the next morning as I got back into town. I gave them the story and the description. They didn't sound concerned, and I've never heard anything else since. Thanks for reading, and please help me explain this one, if you can. The following story is 100% true. The years listed above are the estimated dates that the story roamed free for me. It was the only time in my entire life that I ever questioned my own sanity and or my own perceptions. I ask that you read the story in full, as this is one of those few cases where it's an actual ending to the story. I'm writing this today because I believe the story is one we can learn from. It's a mid-sized city. Located roughly two and a half hours southwest of Chicago, bordering the state of Iowa. The lady in the woods was sighted at a small park, smack dab in the middle of town. The park is surrounded by roughly four to five acres of timber. Sometime in roughly 1993-1994, 
was the first time that I heard about the lady in the woods. I was in the fifth grade, hanging out with some other boys on the grade school grounds. The story is your typical ghost story. Mill Park, our local hangout, just a few blocks away. A child went missing after the sighting of the ghost. More specifically, the ghost of a woman dressed in all white. They didn't know the name of the child, but claimed it happened in 1987. Another boy chimed in. There's also an adult who went missing, the night after a sighting of the same ghost a few years later. In both cases, the sighting happened after the park closed, well after midnight. The park is nestled in between some neighborhoods, and there have always been reports of people who have moved out of their homes after seeing the woman drift through the woods. There were other stories that I heard about in the years after that included witchcraft, Satan worshiping, kidnapping, murder, and the occult. The story gained more momentum when another boy in our class, a few months later, found a pentagram spray painted on a tree on a path near the park. We actually rode our bikes out to see it. It was definitely there, crudely painted in what looked like a real hurry. It was one of those things where there was no real way to know if the pentagram was part of the story or was put there because of the story. When you're in fifth grade, you rarely stop to think about these things through. You only see what's in front of you. And what I was seeing was definitely creepy. In May of 1995, a friend of ours named Michael, who lived only a block away from El Park, his parents decided to allow him to have a sleepover for his birthday party. He invited 10 of us boys to stay the night, just doing what boys do. That night, you can imagine where this thing was headed. Michael knew all the Mel Park ghost stories. He lived the closest out of all of us and had a neighbor who'd given him all kinds of crazy information, or so he claimed. He rehashed a lot of the stories we'd already heard and even added a few others. After some time, as the clock made its way near 1 a.m., it finally happened. One of the boys suggested we sneak out and see if we could find this lady ghost. So that's exactly what we did. We all made it outside, quiet enough, and made our way to Mel Park. Once we made it there, we broke up into groups. A few walked over to the overgrown Little League baseball field. A few headed towards the playground equipment. Myself and another stayed in the parking lot nearest Michael's house. I wish I could give you all kinds of cool things that we did, but in real life, that's not cool. Essentially, we just kind of walked around, looking and waiting. Really, we'd only been there for maybe 15 to 20 minutes when it happened. I kid you not, just like the story, within minutes of us showing up, it was like a lifetime movie. There she was, in the woods to my north. I see what looks like a pale white woman, white hair, white flowing clothes, and white pants. In the night, she looked to glow. It was literally the perfect example of what you could think of as a ghost. I've never been so scared in my entire life. To this day, it's still the most terrifying moment I've ever been in and that includes an automobile accident. Everyone saw her, all 10 of us. She stuck out like a sore thumb. We jetted, and I mean, we ran faster than any of us had ever run before. All of us completely silent, moving at our fastest rate towards Michael's house and safety. I could embellish here and tell you that she chased us or made a move toward us. I could make it out like her head split in half and bees came flying out, but none of that happened. In fact, she was facing a completely different direction. I don't believe the ghost lady even knew that we were there. She looked as if she was simply peering deeper into the woods, as opposed to staring at us frightened little boys running away terrified. That was it. We all made it back safely. We spent the night worried this lady ghost is going to show up and kidnap us. She never showed. We returned to school and the lady of the woods became legend. All of us share the story all of us backing each other up. We even told one of our teachers. She politely listened and then changed the subject. It was the coolest, most terrifying thing that's ever happened to any of us. We had one of the best campfire ghost stories in history. So time passes, like it always does. We move on from grade school to junior high, then to graduating high school. Once we got a little older, the story took a backseat to girls and just living life. I wouldn't say the story died. I know we spoke of it in passing, and I know the story continued on in grade school, at least for a short time after we left. 
One of the 10 boys from the birthday party died of suicide shortly after high school. I took everything in me, not to blame this ghost story on that situation. I don't believe the two are related. We all move on to college. I lose touch with all but one of the 10, though there's a few that I still have on Facebook. Fast forward to 2010. After coming home from college and struggling my way in life, I finally start to get my act together. I find a full-time job, married my now wife, get a dog, and even have a couple of kids. Eventually, we purchase our first home, which so happens to be a block away from my childhood house. I end up in a tiny little house, two streets over from Mill Park. After those floating years, I end up back where it all started. On my days off, I walk my dog in the very park where the Lady of the Woods scared me almost to death. This is where you really start to question yourself and your senses. At 27 years old, I would stare at the location where I saw that lady glowing all those years prior and try to make sense of it all. Now older and wiser, you spend a lot more time trying to feel things out rather than just react. How in the world did I see a ghost in sixth grade with nine other people who all saw the same thing? I know it wasn't a dream, but how could we all be collectively dreaming? And I know it wasn't my imagination either. It was really there. What I saw was real. But your brain has a funny way of making things fuzzy. It's hard to explain, but you just start to question everything. You know it's real, but you know it's not. That sentence shouldn't be. But that's just how my mind would read the situation. It was really something that I wrestled with a bit. Just trying to figure it all out. Summer of 2012. There I am, on another walk with my dog coming up alongside the timber where I saw the lady in the woods all those years ago. I'm thinking of her again. I'm thinking of my childhood friends. I'm wondering if they ever think about that moment like I do. The thought passes as I move along a path that leads me out of the park. In front of me, a large trailer hooked up to a pickup sits in a driveway nearest the park's wooded area. There's a middle-aged man moving some things onto the trailer as I approach. He sees me and says, Hello. I say hello back and then decided to make a little small talk. I ask him if he's moving. The man responds that he just recently sold the home. It was his parents' house and had sold it to a younger couple. Closing was coming up shortly. I mentioned a few other things and then start to head off, but I stop. Because that ghost story was on my mind, I decided to ask the man I didn't know if he knew about the story. Why I did this is beyond me. It's definitely not something I would normally bring up in a random conversation, but this house was the closest one to the sighting, and I just needed confirmation that somebody else out there still knew the story. I don't remember exactly what I said, but I basically asked him if he'd ever heard the ghost stories. I'll never in my remaining years forget what happened next. The man looks at me and smiles. He tells me that he's heard those stories plenty. I'm actually relieved that he had because I didn't actually think through how the conversation would go if he had no clue what I was talking about. Then I proceed to give him the shortened version of the story you just read above. He listened. I could tell he was interested. When finished, he takes a moment and responds. I used to live in this house before the park was built. My parents raised me here. I moved out in 1983 or 84, and my parents have never been here since. My dad passed away in 91, and it was just my mom after that. The ghost you saw, that was my mom. I looked at him completely confused. He continued. My mom had some medical issues that started in the mid 80s and continued all the way up until she passed away this last spring. The medicine they had her on would cause her to sleepwalk. I can't even count the amount of times that I received calls in the middle of the night from the police department advising me that they found my mother wandering in the park. I was told recently one of the neighbors moved out because they were tired of all the commotion. My sister lives in Texas. I could never get it through her thick skull that her mom needed to be moved to an assisted living house, so this went on for years and years. I found out from some friends that she'd become a ghost story to the park. You see, my mom had a favorite robe that was all white. She always slept in the same pearl silk pajamas. Everything was white. She even had white gloves she would put on from time to time. 
I can only imagine what that would look like in the middle of the night. That lamp over there on the playground would just light her up like a Christmas tree. So it was never hard for police to locate her. So you see the ghost you saw? That was my mom sleepwalking. I bet I even got a call that night. I'm speechless. The lady in the woods was real. She wasn't a ghost. She wasn't a dream. She was simply just a woman. She was this man's mother, lonely and suffering from some medical condition that had her wandering the woods at night. I only wish I knew more. I never saw that man again. The new couple moved in, probably oblivious to the ghost story its previous occupant had created. So I wonder, does her legend live on? Is there some fifth graders right now hearing that story for the first time of the lady in the woods? How she appears and kidnaps children? How there's a witch who murders those who see her in the middle of the night? Fast forward to 2021. I've moved from that tiny house into a bigger house in a new city. I no longer visit Mel Park. I never did learn the lady's name, and I always kick myself for not asking the man more questions. The thing that I found so interesting is how a story can become what it is, how one event can impact individuals like it did me. I still think of that lady sometimes. When a story rolls out that seems impossible, the lady in the woods comes to my mind. Sometimes the story is real, but the context is muddled. This single event impacted my approach to everything. I listen, I take in all of the story that I can. Even if it seems impossible, I hold my tongue. Maybe it's impossible, or maybe it's just being interpreted wrong. Thank you for reading. I live in Vermont and grew up here nearly my entire life. I've always been at home in the woods. It's always made me feel calm. I've never really feared being in the woods, especially in the daytime. Vermont doesn't have much to fear nature-wise. I don't have the ability to be silent, but I'm very aware of my noise level as well as the sounds of the woods. I've had those woods go quiet things happen to me a few times, but if you stop moving, the sounds of the woods come back usually within a minute. Twice I've experienced the woods go absolutely silent and felt very uneasy. The first time was when I was hiking with my then girlfriend up Mount Abe, maybe 2012. There's a section of the trail that's really unique and beautiful. The woods become less thick and moss covers most of the ground that you can see. We're hiking through this area. The woods go quiet and we both come to a stop. She asked if I felt that. I replied back that something didn't feel quite right, but laughed it off and jokingly attributed the silence to me huffing. We start off again with her in front of me. The quiet didn't end, and I kept feeling like someone else was there, looking over my shoulder quite frequently. This section of the trail isn't terribly long, maybe a half hour, but time seemed to stand still as the air. We finally get to the intersection of the next trail, and we stop again. Just up the trail, not 30 feet away, we both saw someone run across the trail and go behind a small dead tree. They poked their head out partially from behind it, and then retract back behind the tree. This tree would have been hard for anyone to hide behind, unless it was a child. Without thinking, I walk past her, march over to the tree, and look around. Nothing. Then it felt like the woods woke back up almost immediately. I walked back to her and discussed the whole thing. We both felt this section of the path seemed to take way longer than it should have. And we both noticed how uneasy the silence felt and almost like we weren't alone. We both saw someone run behind that tree and peer around. Neither of us knew what to think, so we just laughed it off and hooked the rest of the way around to the peak. We ate a meal and then chilled for a bit at the top and then went back down the way we came out without anything else happening. I've hooked through there before and never had anything like that ever happen to me again. The second time I felt that silence was the fall of 2016. 
I was out behind my apartment that had a huge area of woods. The nearest road was straight back a little more than three miles east. North and south was maybe 10 plus miles off the woods, between roads. So I'm out maybe a mile deep walking one day. The woods were alive with birds, squirrels, chipmunks, all getting ready for winter. All of a sudden, and instantly, the woods go quiet. I stopped to let it wake back up, thinking it was just me, as I was rustling leaves and standing on twigs. I hear something slowly walking and stops somewhere in the near distance behind me. I look around. Nothing. The woods still quiet. I walk a little further and stop again. Once again, I hear something walking off in the distance, stopping, but still not visible. I did this a few more times with the same result. I begin to get a little concerned and cut north to make my way down a ravine and back west. I get out of that ravine and stop once again, the woods still remaining quiet. And I hear something making its way down in heavy landings in the leaves. I immediately book it in a very random zigzag way, all the way back to my apartment. Again, I've gone out after this and never experienced anything like that again. The state itself says that we don't have cougars or mountain lions, and I think I would have known if it was a bear or some kind of coyote early on. What do you all think? And have you ever experienced the woods going quiet for yourself? everyone thanks for listening if you stuck around to this point if you haven't yet please hit the like button the subscribe button and that notification bell to be notified when future episodes come out if you have a true scary story of your own feel free to send it to my email or post it to my subreddit you can stalk me on twitter you can stalk me on facebook and you can also stalk me on instagram all these links are below what's going on everybody uh thank you so much for listening a uh, huge shout out to joel and dane from let's read and being scared for coming on this episode i wanted to make my like debut episode where i got announced on chilling and have a couple of my favorite chilling narrators come on with me and talk and do one of my favorite subjects to narrate which is like the deep wood stories so hope you enjoyed all of these um and yeah, uh, go over to Chilling. Check Chilling out. Um, I'm on there now. I think I did five five or six stories. It was well over two hours worth of content that you can uh, go check out and listen uh, to me and ex expect more from me moving forward in the future over at Chilling as well. Um, at least, I think, I believe bare minimum, two hours of content every single month will be added from me, if not more. So, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty badass app, so definitely go check it out if you haven't yet. There's insane amount of awesome narrators plus just a bunch of other cool stuff so i've been using it for well over a year now and uh you should you definitely should be too outside of that um i think i'll be uploading another episode to twisted tales today as well um so for those people who like the short form content and uh prefer and don't don't have the patience nor do you want to listen to this long form content which i guess if you're listening to this now then you're not one of those people but if that interests you at all, I will leave the link to Twisted Tales um, down at the bottom as well. And I also made another channel, which is has absolutely nothing to do with horror. It might have horror stuff geared towards it occasionally, but for the most part, this will just be an ambience channel. So I, you know, like I, I love and fall asleep to rain every single night. Um, so, and I love like game ambiences, you know, there's like Minecraft or you know, Red Dead Redemption, you know, just there's too many to name, but you get the you get the gist. You understand what I'm talking what I'm talking about, because I know there's tons of these channels out there, but I wanted to do my own version of this. So if that's also something that interests you, it's going to be like, you know, six, eight, ten hours sometimes of just ambiences. Right now I have um, a Minecraft one with rain and chill, low music. And then I just put up another one of Hey Arnold's Room. Oh, with a certain with about the same thing and then I'm going to be uploading another one um, with the with Bag End in the Shire because I'm a huge Lord of the Rings freak and nerd so that's definitely one I wanted to get out there so long story short go check out Chilling 
Go check out Twisted Tales. Go subscribe to this new channel if you like ambiences and rain and cool and chill lo-fi music and stuff like that too. And um, yeah, uh, I think I'm going to continue to stick with this format for this channel. Uh, once one episode a week, probably every other week will be a topic, you know, like a geared like road trip stories, you know, that type of thing. And then and next the week after that will be like true horror stories So anything. And then once at least once a month, I'll be uploading stories for sleep. So I'll throw all of that stuff together. So again, long story short, just wanted to keep you guys um, in the loop. And then I also have some new announcement announcements to make, but I'll make those in the next episode. I love every single one of you. Thank you so much for the support. Thank you for putting my name out there and getting me on chilling because it's definitely 100%. I have you to thank for that. I love every single one of you. Thank you so much, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.